Hello, morning, everybody. Great to see you all this morning, and uh, a really warm welcome to Shirley Baptist Church. If you're here uh, online, uh, a great welcome to you as well. It's wonderful to be together. As we came into church, Krista said to me, I hope you don't mind me quoting you, Krista, isn't this a great day? And I went, what's so special about today? And she went, it's just good to be here. And I went, oh yeah, the pennies dropped. I don't know where, how you've come this morning in a place of, you know, I'm really glad, like Krista, to be here, or whether there's stuff going on in your life where it's been a real effort to get here, um, or, or, or whether you're thinking, how long will the service go on this morning, because I just want to get home already. <laughs> However you've come this morning, I want to say two things, grace and peace. God is here to meet you exactly where you're at. He loves you into the fullness of life. His love is better than life itself. Let me remind you of that. Um, Dave is very humble. He won't say this himself necessarily, but he and Matt at the back wrote the song they played just now, Faith Into Action. And we have so many gifted musicians and songwriters in the church You're right, Krista, we just need to give thanks to God for today. They are brilliant, and they're going to lead us this morning. Faith into action. His love is better than life itself. It's good to be here together this morning. And to welcome Neil. Neil uh, is uh, the Heber Regional Minister, the Heart of England Baptist Association Regional Minister. That's a mouthful, but he's our guest speaker this morning, so we're delighted. He's dressed up smart for the occasion. Um... And uh, he's going to bring God's word this morning. Neil and I trained at Spurgeon's College together and we reminded ourselves that it was, we finished in 1999, so quite a few years ago. We played football a couple of times together. I'm so much better than Neil. Uh, you're humble, I'm not. Uh, no, joking, joking. Let's get into God's word. I'm going to give you two for the price of one. Psalm 133 and 134. They're short, don't worry. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. It's good to be in unity whatever our differences. And then Psalm 134 says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is maker of heaven and earth. Grace and peace. Two more things. Unity and hands. You may not put your hands in the air. You may put your hands in the air, but your hands are an invitation to be outstretched one to another. Because our God reigns. He is here. So I invite you to stand as we worship. Look to the Son. It's because of Jesus Christ that we gather in worship. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can be in unity. It's because of Jesus Christ that we lift up hands in the sanctuary. It's because of Jesus Christ that we are gathered in his presence. Let's sing.
We're going to take up the offering with this next song. Um, and there are some actions, so I might need some help from somebody over here, but because I can't do actions and play the guitar, but yeah. God's love is big and it is strong and great. Um, just got some notices this morning, Matt, if we can put them on the slide, that's great, and you might have to control these as we go through, that's all right. Uh, load of notices, um, we've got the prayer course starting, many of you follow on a daily basis the Lectio 365 prayer app, which is about 10 minutes each morning, a really good way to centre in on God's presence and perspective for the day ahead. And prayer is something that we're really wanting to encourage in a, a deeper, richer way in the life of the church. And so this course is put on uh, for anybody uh, to enrich their prayer lives. It may be that for you, prayer is something very odd and strange. You're not quite sure where to go with it. Um, that's for you. This course is for you. It may be that you've been praying for years and years and years, uh, but you just still want to be with others in enriching. And um, we've got 45 people signed up already, which is fantastic. Um, but there'll be still time to sign up over the next week or so. 
It's on Wednesday the 1st of May, it will start then, and it's probably going to be in here. We'll have tea and coffee beforehand, and it'll be an hour of learning about prayer together. It'll be great, and it'll last for eight weeks with a, a, a one-week break in between. So do sign up, either online, through Church Suite, we love that, or... Um, you can go to the Welcome Hub out there uh, well, by tea and coffee and sign up physically on a sheet. We love that too. So there's different ways to sign up. Thank you. A uh, little small this is, Amanda. <laughs> Do you, but this is about the, the Women's Weekend at home, which is the 17th and 18th of May. So that's basically, this notice is for 50% of you here this morning. For the other 50% of you, just ignore this for the next minute. But uh, Women's Weekend at home, and you're going to, I think, focus on the five love languages. Is that right? Which are... You... <laughs> I, I, I can't, I don't, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to go for it, right? One love language is, um, is words of affirmation. If you're good at encouraging someone with a word of affirmation, put your hand up in all humility. Don't worry about, if you're, if you're an encourager, put your hand up. We need a few more encouragers at SPC. Uh, the other love language is gifts. Who's good at spending loads of money on other people? Put your hand up. Oh, I really want to know you. Uh, forget words of encouragement. Uh, another one, not only words of encouragement or gifts, but it's also acts of service. So this afternoon, I'm going to do the hoovering, the cleaning, the washing up. Yeah, right, yeah. But if you do something, like act hard, do something really great in the home... That's a real expression of love for someone else. Uh, for someone, it's, uh, it's physical touch. Actually like to be close to someone in a physical way. And then the fifth one is... Oh, thank you. Quality time. Which is why this service is going to go on for two hours. <laughs> if these notices carry on. Um, but go do sign up for the Women's Weekend at Home. Brilliant. It's going to be really fantastic. So please see Amanda about that afterwards or sign up by the Welcome Hub as well. Thank you. Dwell, as you, uh, many of you know, Dwell is our monthly worship service, dwelling in God's presence, spending time in prayer and an extended time of worship. Uh, there's no great design on dwell. It is a simply a place to dwell and see as God leads us. And it's really well attended. We're loving the encouragement that, that brings. Uh, so that's happening on the 5th of May at 6 p.m. Do come along to that as well. Thank you. We also are engaged with the Thy Kingdom Come initiative, which has been running for a few years now, which is across denominations, the 9th and 19th of May, which goes over Pentecost, and there is a 24 hours of prayer set aside by Helen uh, Reed, and that's the 11th to the 12th of May. Do speak to Helen about that. Sign up for an hour or 10 minutes of prayer to give as part of those 24 hours as we want to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, there'll be a sermon series on uh, a kingdom perspective as Christians that will be coming uh, shortly around about Pentecost time as well. I think that's it, Matt. Is that right? Woohoo! Great. Fantastic. I'm for the children and young people and the offering that we've taken. So let me pray for the children and young people and, and the offering as well. Loving God, we thank you so much for one another, for all ages in this church. The youngest and the oldest are equal before you, made in your image. I pray for the children and young people that they will be blessed this morning in their groups. Pray that they'd have fun and they'd be able to enjoy learning about Jesus and really, really think that church is a great place to be. So be with the leaders, be with those who care and guide and 
who disciple young people and children this morning. May they be of a great encouragement. May those, that sense of love be very much a part of all that they experience today. And Lord, our offering this morning that we lift to you, we give in so many various ways. It may be physically this morning, it may be through direct debit, or it may be through giving in other ways. We thank you for the gifts that have been offered today as a response to all that you offer to us. May you use these gifts for the glory of your name in this church and in the world of which we belong. So bless us this morning, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the young people and children are going to their groups, and uh, we're going to continue in a spirit of prayer with prayers of intercession that Amanda's going to lead for us today. Psalm 46, verse 10, may be very familiar to you. It says, be still and know that I am God. And sometimes being still is a bit of a challenge, isn't it? To be still in our busyness or in our worries or even in the middle of our wants and our desires and even in our joys, Actually, being still is really, really important. And so now as we come together this morning in prayer, we're just going to take a moment together because being together in prayer before, before God is really important too. So let's just take a moment just to be still before God and to acknowledge his presence with us here this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Loving God, we praise you and we thank you for your faithfulness and for your constant love for us. When everything around us might feel unstable, unsure, uncertain, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are our rock. You are our place of safety. You are steadfast and sure. You alone can bring unity. And we look to you. We turn to you. When we turn to you with cries of praise and thanksgiving, all cries of pain and desperation. You hear us and you draw near to us. You draw near to all who call on your name in spirit and in truth. You are gracious and compassionate. You are slow to anger and rich in love. As we come before you this morning, we want to encounter your spirit together. And we want to offer cries of praise and cries of desperation. Because in the midst of all that is good in the world and in our own worlds, 
there is still much sadness and pain and we are desperate to see you move and to see your will be done. We pray for the wider world you have created. The news every day gives us graphic insight to the tragedy of war and destruction in places such as Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, Israel, Iran, Sudan, and many, many others. There is poverty and crises in so many places, and so many people live with fear. Fear of war, fear of death, fear of the unknown. We pray for peace, we pray for reconciliation and for restoration across the places in your world that only know terror and loss and deep pain. We pray for world leaders and those in positions of power and authority that hardened hearts will be turned and cold, determined minds will be transformed through the power of Jesus. We put our hope in you, Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for the locally known world, our country and community. We have local elections coming up, the prospect of a general election. There are disagreements and discord up and down the country around all sorts of different issues, unemployment, the cost of living, housing, healthcare problems within the NHS, and so many other things that impact people's lives. And again, Lord, people are living with fear. It might not be the fear of war, but the fear of the unknown. And we pray for your peace and restoration across the places of our local world and community. We pray for our political leaders and church leaders and those in positions of power, that their hearts and minds will be transformed through the power of Jesus. We put our hope in you alone, Lord. Hear our prayer. And we pray for our own worlds, Lord, for our own circumstances and the circumstances of those that we know and love. And we long for your love light to shine in so many places. We all have things going on in our lives that need you and need your healing power and grace. We think of the person sat next to us now or someone close by. We may know them really well, we may not, but you know them by name, just as you know all of us by name. We give you thanks for each other. We pray especially for Matthew and his family for tomorrow and for the days to come. And there is so much to be thankful for, Lord. So help us to give thanks for all your provision for us and for those around us. We're thankful when you hear our cries and you, we can see you at work. We're thankful for those that have had recent surgery or health issues that have been treated well. And we pray for those that have still yet to have surgery and treatment. Within our church family, we pray for continued healing to be with Claire and Evan, Claire and Dave, Morris and Viv, Howard and Barbara, Sue and Margaret and Sue. And there will be others known to us now that we can just name before the Lord. We pray for your comfort to reach those we know that are grieving. Remember Vera and her family, and the family of Phil, whose funeral is tomorrow. And we lift up those we know that are finding life challenging. Finding those moments of stillness is really difficult, and praising you is just tough. Will you encourage us, Lord, to lift each other up to you in prayer? 
Will you encourage us and empower us to seek unity? We pray for one another here. We pray especially for Matt and for all of the leadership team and the deacons here at Shirley. And we pray for the recruitment process that we are currently in for the children's and youth ministries. Guide us, Lord, and help us to discern what your will is in these things. We pray too for Neil as he brings your word to us today. We give you thanks for him and for, for the words of encouragement that he will bring. Lord, we pray that we might all be transformed through the power of Jesus. We put our hope in you, Lord, today. Hear our prayer. Amen. strength within the soul There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that casts our fear You are working Sanctifying us and beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper, you've not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire. Your word. 
working for our good and for your glory. Given what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> A reading this morning is from Psalm 20, and the title on the psalm says, For the Director of Music, A Psalm of David. And it reads, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the Lord, name of the God of Jacob, protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. <clears throat> May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to be here with you again 
I'm going to keep this close to hand because apparently these are they're okay, coming through all right, but I'll pick this up if I need to. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me back again. Always good to be here with you. I have a picture. I wonder if anyone can tell me which rugby team this is. Shout it out. New Zealand. It's the All Blacks. <clears throat> but what are they doing? It's the Haka, Haka, or whatever, how it's pronounced. The Haka, yes. This is what they perform before each of their matches. And uh, I looked up what this is, and apparently it's a traditional Maori war dance that's intended to fire up the warriors and display their pride, strength, and unity before the enemy. There we go, there's fighting talk. And... Uh, I think it is quite intimidating, isn't it? Um, you kind of see the, the opposing teams try and put on a brave face, but actually when they have to sort of stand and watch this uh, traditional kind of ceremony being acted out in this kind of very uh, kind of powerful way, it's, uh, it, it's kind of sowed, sowed seeds of, of doubt and a little bit of fear, I'm sure, in the opposition. Why am I mentioning that? <clears throat> Well, I think Psalm 20, which is a psalm of David, could be described as an ancient Israelite hacker. There we go. You're seeing it in a new light now. <laughs> it was written by David probably as a, as a, a national prayer, but a, a song to be declared and chanted and sung by the army of Israel before they went out to meet an enemy. Now, in David's time, the enemy were a number of different nations at different times. For example, the Egyptians, they were fighting fairly regularly. The Philistines, the Canaanites, the Syrians, there were others too. But those, the one thing that kind of all of those enemy nations had in common that would stand to fight against Israel was that all of them had chariots and horses. Israel at that time did not. So you can imagine if you're an Israelite soldier and you're all lined up on one hillside and generally they would they would sort of, that's their starting point would be to range themselves along a hillside and then the enemy would be along the other hillside and the valley in between at some point was where the battle was going to happen. And you can imagine, I'm sure, if you're an Israelite soldier facing whichever of these enemies they happen to be facing at that time and seeing their chariots and horses and knowing that you had nothing like the firepower and strength that the, opposites, the opposition had ranged against you. I just think what a frightening and nerve-wracking experience that must have been. I don't know if you've kind of been up in kind of close uh, contact with, with horses. I can remember once, years ago, uh, going to, it was a, on a Wednesday for a midweek uh, international friendly. England were playing someone, and I can't remember who, and uh, I'd gone to, this is the old Wembley Stadium, and I'd gone there uh, with a friend to watch this friendly match, um, but it was really, really foggy, and so they kept us all outside the stadium, and there were quite a few of us all sort of packed in, waiting to be let in, but they didn't want to let us in because they weren't sure if they were going to be able to play the match because of the fog. Anyway, they took the decision eventually that they could not play it, they wouldn't be able to see enough. And so uh, over the loudspeakers, they were encouraging us all to go home. Well, you can imagine, we'd all gone there, we wanted to watch a match, and we weren't too keen to just turn around and go home. Uh, and of course, the police that were there, um, uh, many of them mounted police on horseback. Um, 
then just started riding through the crowd. And uh, that soon dispersed us. <laughs> we changed our minds. Of, but, you know, just being up close to these powerful animals and uh, that sense of, uh, of awe and fear if they were coming at you uh, with a vengeance. I can only imagine how frightening that experience might be. And so David had written this psalm to put courage into the army, into the soldiers, and to remind them, and I think this is the key thing about this psalm, to remind them that actually where we place our trust and where we direct our focus is key to withstanding and eventually overcoming whatever problems or obstacles or challenges we face. Let me just say that again. David was encouraging them and reassuring them that where we put our focus, where we put our trust, will we'll then determine if we will overcome the challenges we face. Is this now resonating with you? A little bit later on, we'll think and put some flesh on the bones of what are those things perhaps that we are facing and be a bit more specific about that and, and pray about those things. But in this context of the Israelite army waiting to go out, <clears throat> naturally, it's human nature. I think the Israelites' focus would have been on the horses and chariots kind of maybe mentally counting them and thinking, oh my goodness, we've got nothing to counteract that. Even the enemy army, I think their focus will also have been on their chariots and their horses. And they're probably thinking, we've got so many chariots and horses, we are going to win the day. But in verse 7, it says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. And this is the word that David was putting into the hearts of his people. But we, don't forget, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. The chariots, the horses are kind of representative of our human resources, I think. Our own ability. And if we put our trust in human resources, in things, then it is misplaced. Our trust needs to be in the name of the Lord our God. If we put our trust in our resources, then of course that leads to self-confidence and pride, which was actually the, the downfall of the enemy many times. Because their focus, their trust was in their horses and chariots. So actually they were confident in themselves and proud. If the Israelites' focus and trust was in the horses and chariots when they had none, then of course they would have a sense of inadequacy. And that would lead to fear and doubt. So focusing on horses and chariots, not good. Focusing on the name of the Lord our God. And then we can withstand and overcome. Of course, Jesus picked up on this theme in his ministry when he was teaching uh, about the, the man who built his house upon the sand as opposed to the man who built his house upon the rock. What was it Jesus said? He said, if you hear these words of mine and put them into practice, he said, then you are like the man, person who built their house upon the rock. So actually, if we get to know Christ through his word, if we get to know his promises, when we remind ourselves and put our focus on him, his might and his majesty, his plans and his purposes, then it is as, if, is as if we have built our lives on something solid, 
a solid foundation that is the rock. And of course, Jesus said, when the storms come, or when we face the enemy, or when the opposition is, is stacked against us, when we seem to be facing severe challenges or insurmountable odds, we can stand firm because our lives are built upon the rock, upon the teaching, the person of Christ Jesus, his love for us and his promise never to leave us nor forsake us, but to always enable and equip us to be able to live for him. Then that's a firm foundation. But, of course, the opposite is if we put our trust in ourselves, if we put our trust in our resources, if we think we are we know how to handle these things that we face, then it's like building our lives on shifting sand, isn't it? Because those things, when compared with the resources of the kingdom of heaven, are nothing. Now, from an early age, David, who wrote the psalm, had first-hand experience of what seemed overwhelming opposition and unfavorable odds. As he grew up, he began life as a shepherd boy looking after his father's sheep. When he did, uh, we we read in 1 Samuel that he would uh, at times face the lion and stand up against the lion to protect the flock. At other times, he was faced with the bear and he was not overwhelmed because he had his trust in the name of the Lord his God. And then we have that story in 1 Samuel 17. Very, very familiar, isn't it? When his father had sent him to, actually again, where the Israelite army were camped facing, in this case, the enemy was the Philistine army. Saul was king. David was just a boy. And his father sent David with food and resources to give to his brothers because, of course, that's how it happened in those days. And when he arrived, he heard Goliath taunting the Israelites, this giant of a man, apparently around nine foot tall. And uh, he was their champion, and he was he's kind of throwing out these challenges. Send, send your champion out to meet me, and whoever wins, that people will be victorious. And no one had the courage to go and face Goliath. Even Saul, who we're told was, as king, was head and shoulders above any other man in his whole army. So if anyone should have been the champion of the Israelites to go out and face Goliath, it should have been Saul. Where do we find Saul? Saul's in his tent. David is incensed because David has grown up learning to trust God, whatever the odds, whatever he faced. And he could not stand that this enemy was throwing out these taunts and challenges. And no one was prepared to go out and face him. And he said, I'll go. I'll go and face him. I've faced the lion. I've faced the bear. I don't, I'm not frightened to go up against this Goliath. And of course, he's taken to the tent, shown to King Saul. And uh, what does Saul do? He tries to put his armor on David. Now, Saul is the tallest man in the Israelite army. David is a mere boy. How ridiculous that Saul would think that his human resources would somehow help David to fight his battle. You can imagine everything sort of two sizes too large and him not even be able to move. Never mind lift the sword and carry the shield. These are kind of the chariots and horses of the Psalm 20. And Saul wants to clothe him in these human resources in order to face the challenge ahead. And David said, this is ridiculous. I cannot go and meet Goliath with these things. All I need is my sling, and I will go and meet him. So, of course, he goes out. He selects five 
we're told, stones from the, the river brook. And with his sling, he's, as a shepherd boy, he would be very proficient with the sling. And uh, that's all he needs. This is something he will have practiced day after day after day as he looked after the sheep. He will have become very proficient with this skill that God has given him. But other than that, he knows he just needs to go out in God's strength. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. You see that same thing that he then wrote. He'd learned this over many years, so when he wrote his Psalm 20, he knew what it meant to find his strength in the Lord. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. I expect you know how the story ends, of course. He takes a stone and he fires it off. It hits Goliath. In the forehead, he falls back and is defeated. The Philistine army, realizing that actually now the victory had been handed to the Israelites, turn and flee. And the victory is God's. Because David went out in the name of his Lord. So let's think about our challenges our opposition, the things we're facing, the insurmountable odds, perhaps, that we're up against in our lives. I wonder what they might be. I'm sure we all have things. Maybe they are financial concerns. Maybe we have debts that are are racking up and we just do not know how we're going to be able to settle these because... The money coming in and the money going out just does not add up. Maybe we're feeling insecure in our finances. I, uh, coming to retirement age, so end of February next year, I will be at retirement age. I tell you what, my mind is quite focused on my pensions at the moment. And... And for various purposes, I've had to sort of start to tot up, you know, what, what life, what finance, financial security might look like for me in less than a year's time. And will it be enough? And if I'm not careful, I get too focused on those things and begin to worry. Because as ministers, well, I think we know we're not, uh, the world's, In financial, human financial terms, richest people. We're very rich in many other ways. But if my focus is on the wrong thing, on human resources, on those things, then I can be very fearful, I tell you. And I have to be reminded regularly that to put my trust in the name of the Lord, my God, and his provision. Maybe it's a health issue, a health concern of yours or a loved one, maybe a prognosis which looks really serious and really not sure what this is going to mean. Maybe it's a treatment regime that just feels so, so aggressive. Maybe for you, the opposition that's stacked against you is is a relationship difficulty, and you've tried all sorts of things. But somehow that relationship just seems to go from worse to worse. And we don't know the way forward. Maybe it's a work situation. I wonder what you're up against. And I wonder what our response is to these things that we're facing. Perhaps we do find ourselves like I do from time to time, perhaps too often, trusting in my own resources, my chariots 
and my horses. And I'm hoping that I have enough chariots and horses to get me through. But chariots and horses have a way of failing. If we look back even further in our Old Testament narrative to the time when the Israelites were escaping from Egypt, this is the time of Moses, Moses had been called to lead them out, and uh, Pharaoh, after the plagues, had let them go, do you remember, and then changed his mind. And as the Israelites were fleeing from Egypt, and they were finding themselves trapped by the Red Sea. Pharaoh had sent all of his army, and it said all of his horses and chariots, to chase them down and to bring them back. Again, how the Israelites must have felt, trapped by that situation, insurmountable odds. But we read in Exodus 14, verse 25, He, that is God, made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. I just think that's so funny. You know, this is how God rescued his people then. The wheels came off the chariots. And it seems to me that when we put our trust in horses and chariots, they, they have a habit of the wheels coming off. When we put our trust in our own resources, in our own understanding, in our own way of doing things, in our self-confidence, then those things have a habit of the wheels coming off. That's been my experience. But when we put our trust in the name of the Lord our God, then we have a sure place to stand and we can overcome The Lord then went on to say to you, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And of course, the Israelites, even though it's many hundreds of years later, when David had written this psalm and they were facing their enemy, they were brought up with these stories of the exodus, the escape, and how God rescued them from insurmountable odds. So what are we to do? We are, according to this psalm, not to put our trust in chariots and horses, but instead to put our trust in the name of the Lord our God. So what does that mean in conclusion? How do we put our trust in the name of God? Well, names have meanings. My name has a meaning. Letitia. I come from Guernsey, so it's a French name, my French family. But my name, Letitia, means the weaver. And as far as we can tell, my ancestors uh, were weavers. They wove baskets for fishing, fishing baskets for catching uh, kind of lobsters and crabs and and things like that. That's largely what they did. They probably wove um, basket, uh, you know, the, the, um, the weaving for other things too, possibly thatched roofs. So names have meanings. I wonder what your name means, whether you've looked into it. But names can tell us something about a person or their family, maybe their occupation, maybe their place of origin, maybe their clan affiliation, their parentage or physical characteristics. Names often, and certainly in in those times in ancient Israel, names very often meant something that told people something about that person. Well, the same is true of God. The name of the Lord our God tells us very much who he is. His name is Yahweh in the Hebrew. God told that to Moses when he called him and asked him to go and bring the people of Israel out. Yahweh means I am who I am. It can also mean I've always been who I always was. It can also mean I will always be who I will always be. There's no tense in this. 
So it's kind of a, a name which embraces any situation and a reminder that God will always be sufficient for everything and anything that we need him for. In Latin, the word Jehovah would perhaps be more familiar. And throughout uh, the Bible, we see different sort of um, words added to Jehovah, which tell us a bit more about the nature of God, his love for us, his work in our lives, his desire for us, and his promises. I uh, put a few of these together. Here we go. Here's just a, a selection, half a dozen, of the names of God, the versions of his name. Jehovah Adonai, the Lord our sovereign. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, and so on and so forth. It's a reminder of the God that we serve, encapsulated in the name of the Lord Almighty. If you Google names of God, you'll see a whole list of them with references, really helpful. But each of these names also carries with it a characteristic, but also a set of promises. And again, if you Google God's promises, um, there are many, many of them. In fact, there's someone produced something called 365 Promises of God. It's a really helpful one where they've picked just 365, but enough for one per day. Begin every day with one of the promises of God. Get to know him through his promises so that when we face difficulty, challenge, overwhelming odds, we've begun as David kind of practiced with his sling and became proficient in how to approach the opposition. So we would become proficient with God's word and God's character and his nature and his promises so that we would have actually the tools that we need to overcome whatever the enemy might throw in our path. But just picking up on these, perhaps if you're feeling overwhelmed by your circumstances, perhaps in your praying, use that name, Jehovah Adonai, that God is sovereign, as a reminder that nothing is impossible for God. Whatever the odds might look like, he is sovereign. Maybe if you feel lacking in some way or you're concerned financially or about the future, invoke the name of God, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide and hold on to that promise and watch him fulfill his promise. Maybe it's a health situation, Jehovah Rapha. Please bring your healing power into my life, into the life of my loved ones. Maybe you're feeling anxious. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace, put your peace in my heart, and so on. That's putting our trust in the name of the Lord our God. So let me wrap up. Some trust in horses, some in chariots. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Where is my trust? Where is your trust? I pray that whatever we face this week, this month, this year, however overwhelming it might feel, that we would put our trust in God's nature, his power, his majesty, his love for us, and his promises his plans for you and for me, and to be still and let him have the victory. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that in your word we can know you. Thank you that you are sovereign, Lord, that you have all the resources we need to live our lives facing any challenges along the way that in, as we put our trust in you, put, build our lives upon your rock, 
so we can withstand and ultimately overcome. Lord, give us your peace in our hearts, whatever we face this week, as we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to use a song as our immediate response. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And then the chorus, let us worship the name of God. Let's stand and sing together.
A new commandment I give to you. Love one another, says Jesus, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is an open invitation for all who love the Lord Jesus and receive the love that he pours out to you. And if you respond to that unconditional love, if you trust, as Neil has reminded us, in the name of the Lord, the name that is above every other name, that ev- at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Wouldn't it be incredible if everyone in this church bowed before Jesus, the name that is above every other name, bowing towards his love that is for you. So come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come, you who have done this for years and years and years, and may the Spirit of the Lord fall afresh upon you as you come in a new deeper awareness of Jesus' love. Come you who are prompted by the Spirit for the first time today because you've heard the word, you've sung alongside those beside you and you have opened your heart and mind to the love of Christ which gives you a new life. Come because he loves you and gave himself for you. This is the greatest expression of love the world has ever known. Jesus on the cross. Let's pray a prayer of confession. Come Lord, come to us. Enter our darkness with your light. Fill our emptiness with your presence. Come, refresh, restore, renew us. In our sadness, come as joy. In our troubles, come as peace. In our fearfulness, come as hope. In our darkness, come as light. In our frailty, come as strength. In our loneliness, come as love. And if you're responding to that invitation and if you have joined me in that prayer of confession, whether there is darkness or emptiness or sadness or trouble or fear or frailty or loneliness, you are loved. I say the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer, and if you'd like to join me, please do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite the deacons who are serving this morning and uh, I think Glynis, if you'd like to come up as well, that would be wonderful just to help. Just a couple of practicalities as we serve the bread and wine this morning. Uh, you'll be served where you are seated uh, this morning and um, we are, which is a wonderful blessing, growing a little bit in number as a church. And so communion takes a little bit longer to get round. Um, if you're able to, pass the wine and the bread. Not, you know, like just rush it, but, but swiftly. That would be great. Uh, I think you're getting what I'm saying. And, um, and yet we want to be resting in God's presence, not rushing. Um, so it's a hard sort of balance to get. 
but there will be stillness and quiet and reflection as we take bread and wine this morning. And this invitation, as I said, is for all who love the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to do two things at once. I'm going to try and use this mic and break the bread, but we'll see how we go. I'm not going to use the mic, but you're going to hear me right over there. The Apostle Paul received the tradition passed on to him and said these words. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, having took the bread... He broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship, the restoration reality, the truth that God and humanity are together as one in Christ. Because of Christ, his love for a world that needs to be loved. This new covenant, this new commitment. The Lord Jesus, he took the bread and took the cup. And so whenever you drink of the cup, you proclaim me until I return. So let us, here at Shirley Baptist Church, proclaim the name of Jesus until he returns. Amen. Amen. So the body of Jesus is given for you. The blood of Jesus is poured out for you. There is gluten-free bread in the cups uh, that will be offered for those who need it. I'm going to invite the deacons to come up now and take the bread. As you are served, do reflect upon the body of Christ and then you'll be served the wine and hold the cups together and we will drink the wine together as a sign of our unity that was said at the very beginning of the service. But when you take the bread, you can eat that in your own time, reflecting on what you have heard today. Amen. Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once
will know that you are my disciples. By this sharing of bread, by this breaking of bread, by this symbol of life, by the poured out wine, the blood that is spilt on the cross is the healing of the nations, the healing in our lives, the hope for all. This death on the cross 2,000 years ago is as real today as all those days in the past and all those days to come. Jesus is the Lord of history, the Lord of all nations, the Lord of this community, the Lord of your lives. We once again think upon the sacrifice but we're moving into a different place of intimacy with God. So as you'll serve the wine, hold the cup and we'll drink together as a sign of our oneness in him.
So let us drink together the blood of Jesus who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. way to bless each other as we close our service today. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Go in peace to love one another as disciples, followers of Jesus. Go in peace to trust in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Neil, for your word this morning. Thank you for leading us in worship. And there'll be a couple of songs played as you go for tea and coffee. If you want to stay, Please do stay and worship, but if you want to go and get tea and coffee, do go. If you'd like to go and get your children, I'm sure they'd love to, you to go and get them as well. Um, linger in this place if you'd like. Leave if you'd like. Have tea and coffee if you like. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. Amen.